Welcome everybody to um, Learn Community Education webinar and I'm Dee Childers with Life Changes Elder Care Consulting and Vice President for Learn and the Community Education Coordinator or Chair. And today our topic uh, is Trust, Conservatorships and Fiduciary Responsibility. As soon as I get on the right screen here. Um, LEARN is a lifelong education and aging resource network and is an Idaho-based nonprofit uh, providing community education on aging and caregiving topics. And LEARN is part of the Society for Certified Senior Advisors, a leaders network. And our disclaimer today is this content is provided for general informational purposes only and not to be considered legal, financial, or health advice. Please consult with your appropriate professionals before taking action based on this information. Today's sponsors are Oasis Senior Advisors and providing free personal senior living assistance with local trusted advisors and helping you navigate the quagmire of senior living. And their website is available here. And then A Mind for All Seasons which is leading the revolution in brain health for individuals and institutions with their comprehensive approach to brain health and healing. And today our speaker is Paul Seideman from uh, Trusco and they are a trust and estate service company and his uh, information is um, his web, his email, I'm sorry, his website is there. Um, I've gone one slide too far, so I'm going to back up here. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paul, although he did not give me that much to go on. So you will have to all uh, embellish there. It's better um, to keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is the president of Tresco of Idaho, an independent fiduciary company based in Idaho. And he's past president of the National Guardianship Association and past and pres present future um, president of the Idaho Guardian and Fiduciary Association here in Idaho. Um, he has more than 25 years of experience in financial services and probate administration and provides an incredibly wonderful service. So I am going to go ahead and put Paul's presentation on the screen here. And so, Dara, give me my feedback. Have I got the right screen up? Are you seeing you Paul's presentation? Yes. Wonderful. And Paul, take it away. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for those of you who are joining us during this live session uh, and also for anybody tuning in uh, after the fact to try to find out more about this unusual world of fiduciary services and, and uh, what exactly is that and what do fiduciaries do and should you be in a position where you are uh, are working with a, a fiduciary in some capacity um, what should your expectations be what how do you know if they're doing a good job or, or not so great of a job um, and so we'll start with just the basics and this is always the first thing that, uh, that comes up when, when people ask me what it is that I do and I tell them that I'm a professional fiduciary, uh, they look, look at me strangely and, and they say, well, I don't really know what that means. And so, uh, so basic definition is uh, a fiduciary is a, a person or an entity that has been entrusted with managing money or property on behalf of somebody else. And there's a lot of different ways that that can happen, uh, but the basics is that someone over here is giving authority to someone over here uh, to, to be responsible for money and property that belongs to this person. Um, so when, when uh, they accept that fiduciary role acting on behalf of another person, then there's a bunch of responsibilities that go along with that. Um, and, uh, and those responsibilities can include uh, a very broad range of things, um, including being responsible for real property, for personal property, 
uh, for a person's income and, uh, and all sorts of financially related decisions. Um, and the scope of that authority depends largely on what type of authority has been granted and what is the source of that authority. And we'll jump to the next slide here. So when it comes to what are the, the most common types of fiduciary roles, the one that most people are familiar with um, is acting as a power of attorney. And uh, in, in our side of the pond, we deal with, uh, with power of attorney for finances. Uh, we do not act as a power of attorney for healthcare decisions. Uh, I leave that to people like me and, and others who are experts in those areas because uh, as we'll see, there's a lot to know and a lot to be competent in um, on both sides of this equation of, uh, of helping manage people's financial affairs and dealing with people's personal affairs. Um, and uh, and it, it's hard enough to be a, a competent expert just in one half of that equation. Uh, so acting as power of attorney um, is where the, a person has delegated by contract authority to someone else to act on their behalf. So they have signed a power of attorney form uh, and there's several different types of power of attorneys, not really going to go into all of the details of, of the variety out there. Um, but the, the person um, that is named as receiving that authority on behalf of the other person is referred to as an attorney in fact. So they're, they're basically acting on behalf of the person who granted the power of attorney and there's certain authority delegated to them uh, under that power of attorney document that states, here's the things that they can do uh, and maybe has a listing of restrictions of things that they're not able to do. Um, but the scope of authority is based within, generally within that power of attorney document itself. Uh, the, the second role, um, a common one that, that Tresco serves in is acting as a conservator of a state. Um, and the language gets a little strange because in, in Idaho, uh, we use the, the term conservator uh, when we're talking about uh, a, a person or, or a party that has been appointed to manage finances and financial affairs. Uh, for somebody who is vulnerable or incapacitated or otherwise unable to, uh, to make financial decisions independently. Um, we use the term guardian for the person that makes personal and medical decisions for that person. Uh, but it gets a little strange because that terminology is interchangeable. Um, and some states will use guardian of the person and guardian of the, of the uh, estate. Um, in California specifically, they like to use the term conservatorship and it's conservatorship of the person and conservatorship of the estate. So guardianship and conservatorship are, are fairly interchangeable terms and it largely depends on what state you're in as to what exact, what term is being used locally and, uh, and what realm of authority that, uh, that title has with it. Uh, but a conservator of an estate uh, is a conservator of the estate of somebody during their lifetime. Um, and so a lot of people think of an estate in terms of what's left after somebody passes away. Um, but in fact, uh, an estate is anything that somebody owns, even if they're still living as of today, it's still considered their estate. So the conservator of the estate um, rather than, than being granted by the person like a power of attorney document would provide, a uh, conservator of a state has to be appointed by a court. And so a, a judge and, and through a court process uh, will appoint somebody as a conservator of an estate. Um, and that can be either on a temporary basis. Um, and generally in Idaho, that temporary basis is set for a 90 day period in order to just help uh, kind of put some immediate guardrails in to protect the assets of the person until a final decision can be made. Um, and then uh, after roughly 90 days, uh, a, another hearing is held with the same judge or in the same court 
uh, to determine if that conservatorship needs to continue on um, or, uh, or if it can be dropped because the circumstances that arose for the need um, are no longer uh, necessary. So, uh, and the scope of authority of somebody who's acting as conservator of the estate uh, is defined either within the scope of the order that was signed by the judge, so the orders from the court, or defined in the statute um, and, uh, and the laws that, um, that regulate conservatorship and guardianship are found uh, under the probate section of the law uh, here in the state of Idaho. Um, the next, uh, next role is uh, acting as personal representative of an estate. So a personal representative is appointed to manage the estate of a person after the person passes away. So during, during their lifetime, that, that reference is going to be for somebody acting as a conservator. When they pass away, then all of those, uh, all of those assets and all of that uh, financial interest will transfer under the authority of the personal representative of the estate. Uh, again, one of those confusing terminology things because most people are familiar with the term executor um, and or executrix uh, and and the terminology personal representative is specific to the state of Idaho. Um, it's how Idaho refers to that same type of position. Many other states still use the terms either executor or executrix for male or female. Um, but it's still referencing the person who is executing or carrying out the final wishes as defined in a person's will. Um, or if there is no will, um, or a, a will doesn't, doesn't encompass all of the, the various decisions and assets that need to be made, uh, then sometimes then there's a default that, uh, that we fall back on. And we look in the statutes that say, well, if a person does not have a will, uh, what do we do with, with their money and property? Um, and how do we decide who gets that? Um, uh, and that is, uh, that is part of what we refer to as the probate process. So if anybody's ever heard of going through probate, that's what that process is, is the, the, uh, uh, the process that we follow to be able to identify somebody's assets uh, as of the time that they passed away and go through the process of conveying those interests over to uh, whoever the beneficiaries of the estate are. Um, thankfully, in Idaho, probate is a very simple process by comparison to many other states, particularly states like New York and California. Um, and it's, uh, it's not expensive, um, it's not uh, particularly onerous. Um, and so I, I try to, to let people know when they're talking to us about their estate plans and they're asking me, well, should I go to an attorney and have a will drafted or should I have a trust drafted? I frequently will tell them, you know, really, um, unless you've got some, some compelling reasons why some of that money might need to be controlled um, and have some, some guardrails around it after you pass away, uh, a will in Idaho is just as effective as a trust. Uh, the, the process of settling a, a will versus settling a trust is about 99% the same. Um, and so um, there, there's really not much difference in terms of, of what that process looks like. And that brings us to, and, and I'm sorry, so last thing here. Uh, so personal representatives of their authority, again, is defined in those probate uh, statutes. And, uh, and the estate only has authority over assets that had the person's name attached to it. Um, so it would have to be property or accounts or businesses uh, that, that that person specifically under their individual name um, had, uh, had in their own name as, as the, the title holding it. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing some typing going on at the bottom of the screen, and I, I'm not sure if that's just side commentary going on or if there's anything that I need to answer or address. But if you do have any questions that come up, uh, or if you think of anything, then please uh, type those in and we'll be happy to address it. Or 
we'll have some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation as well. And Paul, could I just mention that one of the things that people um, frequently don't realize is that power of attorney becomes null and void upon death, and that's when personal representative kicks in. So power of attorney doesn't exceed death. That is correct, yes. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, an important distinction, uh, power of attorney does terminate upon the death of the person that granted that authority, but conservatorship, interestingly enough, does not. Um, so a conservatorship actually continues because the authority wasn't granted by the person who was, was living at the time, it was granted by the court and therefore has to be terminated by the court um, and generally is not terminated until after a personal representative is appointed for the person's estate and the conservator can transfer those assets over to the personal representative. Um, so in general terms, oh, I'm sorry, can we back up? We, we still need to talk through the, the trust side of that. So trustee, uh, somebody who is acting as a trustee of a trust. So a trust, uh, again, in general terms, a trust is an, a separate entity that's established by somebody for the purpose of holding money and property separate from themselves. So it's almost like establishing a business entity and transferring money and property into that entity so that it's separated from myself um, and, uh, and provides some protections um, and also allows uh, for those assets to be controlled by that, the, the documents that define that entity um, even after I pass away. Uh, so the person that takes money and transfers it into a trust um, is generally referred to as the grantor or the settlor uh, of the trust. And that's the person that actually puts the, uh, the, the um, assets into the trust initially. Sometimes that's an individual, sometimes that's a married couple. Um, that's, those are the most common kinds of trusts that, that we see. Um, but a trustee of a trust has much narrower authority than a conservator of an estate or a personal representative of an estate. A trustee only has authority over uh, the, the trust itself and any assets that belong to the trust and any beneficiaries who are affected by the trust. Um, and so there's, there's some limitations there. So when you look at these, these different roles, um, all of them have some unique aspects to them. Not one of these is fully encompassing of everything that, uh, that somebody might possibly have a financial uh, interest in. Um, and so there's times where uh, we have been appointed both as a conservator of an estate and trustee of a trust, or after the person's passed away, uh, we, we may in some cases act as a, a trustee of their trust as a successor to, to go through the settlement phase of that trust. Uh, but there might be assets that are outside of the trust. Um, and if that's the case, then sometimes we still have to go through the probate process, being appointed as personal representative of their estate for the things that aren't already in the trust. To gather them up, you, you put your hands around those things and bring them over and put them into the trust. And then the trust flows out to whoever the, the final beneficiaries are. So, okay, now we can move on. All right, so in, in broad terms, what can a fiduciary do? Uh, and I, I just in these three uh, very common areas that, uh, that we deal with uh, where we may need to either buy or more commonly sell real estate, uh, which of these things can each of these roles do? So as a power of attorney for finances, uh, can you buy or sell real estate? Yes, uh, generally speaking, um, unless there's a specific restriction on that in the power of attorney document. Uh, can a conservator buy and sell real estate? Yes, uh, to the extent that the real estate is owned or, or is uh, benefiting uh, the, the person under conservatorship. So if that person owns that real property with somebody else, uh, then the conservator only has authority, authority over the portion of that real property that's owned by the person. Um, and with a trustee, again, can a trustee buy or sell real estate? Yes, but only if the real estate is titled in the name of the trust. If the real estate is named 
uh, in, in the name of the person, even if that's the same person that set up the trust, the trustee doesn't have any authority over that property. Uh, who can access bank accounts or investment accounts? Can a power of attorney? Yes, they can. Uh, again, unless there are specific restrictions. Uh, can a conservator? Yes, they can, as long as they're titled in the individual name of the person. Uh, can a trustee? Maybe, but only, again, the trustee only has authority over the trust assets, and so it would have to be bank accounts or investment accounts that were specifically titled in the name of the trust. Uh, well, what about, so other than assets, we also have to deal with income um, and managing income or retirement benefits, uh, and who can take care of that? Can a power of attorney take care of that? Yes, they can. Um, again, most often uh, that they would be allowed to do that uh, because they would be granted access to bank accounts and, and many financial institutions will uh, accept a power of attorney. As a matter of fact, uh, it's probably the most common response that I get uh, anytime I walk into a bank and we've got uh, orders from a court appointing us as a conservator or as a personal representative of an estate. Um, I most common reaction I get from the banker on the other side of the, the teller window is, well, we'll need to get a power of attorney document signed. And I'm sure in healthcare arena, uh, that's probably not unusual either for those that, that are familiar with, uh, with guardianship and, and how all of that works. Uh, so managing income and retirement benefits, power of attorney does have the ability to do that. Uh, a conservator has the ability to manage that. Um, but a trustee probably does not, uh, because again, the trustee only has authority over the trust, and that doesn't mean that they've got authority over the income of the person that established the trust, um, unless the person takes that income and, uh, and is able to transfer it into their trust, um, either by putting it into an account with the name of the trust on it, or by, uh, by actual transfer from a personal account to a trust account. Uh, to put it under the authority of the trustee. Okay, now we can move on. Um, so one of the big questions is how do fiduciaries make decisions? And, and I guess the, to step back for a moment, um, I'll say you know, what's my experience been in dealing with fiduciary things? Um, and uh, as Dee mentioned in my super abbreviated bio, uh, my background is in banking and finance. And so I, I spent a number of years uh, working for um, what used to be Washington Mutual Bank, now presently part of Chase Bank Group. Um, and, uh, and as a branch manager, uh, I was a, a lender uh, and oversaw uh, commercial type loans, personal loans, real estate loans, uh, investments and uh, a, a wide variety of, uh, of financial services. And I, I thought that I had pretty good exposure to all the different things that a fiduciary might do. And so when I came uh, from, when I left Spokane, Washington and moved down to Boise, Idaho to start with Tresco uh, in 2008, I thought I had a really solid base of understanding of, uh, of the kinds of things that fiduciaries might need to, to be competent in and, and be able to deal with. Um, and I quickly found out that, uh, that I was uh, not nearly as, as prepared as, uh, as I thought that I was. And I uh, uh, found out that there is just, there's so much to learn and so much to understand. Um, and I was thinking through all of the areas of competency related to uh, financial fiduciary services. And of course, one of the, the main things um, is dealing with, uh, with banking and finance, which I felt really confident in. But then I, I had never really spent a, a lot of exposure dealing with the legal process and just understanding how the law works, um, not just how statutes read, but actually interacting with attorneys and judges and going through the processes involved in court proceedings and understanding what's the difference between uh, between a, a motion and a petition and uh, and why we would have hearings for certain kinds of things, but not other kinds of things. And so there's a lot to learn about the law, um, a lot to learn about accounting and taxes, uh, real estate. And under real estate, 
we might have we might be dealing with with residential real estate we might be dealing with agricultural real estate uh, or commercial real estate interests uh, we frequently have to deal with tenant landlord issues uh, we deal with with leases and contracts uh, all kinds of insurance related issues uh, you know, especially medical insurance life insurance property insurance um, we have to uh, be well versed in uh, in investments and finance, um, and we also have to learn how to navigate government agencies, which is super fun. Uh, as many of you know, dealing with uh, dealing with health and welfare uh, is one thing, but dealing with the IRS and the state tax commission uh, and you know other uh, other regulatory agencies and and uh, just parts of of all of this. Uh, knowing what questions to ask and what answers you should be getting. Um, and uh, I have found that as we've kind of come alongside a lot of, of individuals and family members that are kind of doing what we're doing and we're helping them out and giving them some advice, what I find is that a lot of times they'll walk into a bank and the bank gives them an answer, but it's because, and, and they don't know that the answer that they received was completely off base um, because they just don't know what should I be saying. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> so <clears throat> getting up to a point where you've got competency in all these different areas is really vital because you've got to be able to know what you're talking about when you're relating to all of these people. And especially, you know, when you're talking about law and accounting and real estate and insurance uh, and, uh, and investments, and you're, you're interacting with all these people that do that specific niche all the time, and that's their profession, <coughs> you've got to be able to talk at their level. You've got to understand what they're telling you. You've got to know what kinds of questions you need to be thinking about and, and asking. Uh, and so learning to be conversational about all these different areas um, is, uh, is a, an enormous database of information to try to assimilate um, and not just understand, but be able to really work in and, uh, and be able to function operationally within. So with all that as, as kind of a, a, a background to that, then the, the, the question becomes, so what's the framework? If somebody's granted all this broad authority, what's the framework for how they're supposed to be using that authority? Um, and, and how do they make those kinds of, uh, or the kinds of decisions they might be called on to make when it, when it is related to uh, the, the financial interests of the person that they're appointed for? And that is one of the distinctions, is that as a professional fiduciary, we are acting on behalf of somebody else. And when, when this authority is granted to us, we have to recognize that that authority is granted for the purpose of carrying out the interests of the person that we are, uh, that, that we are working on behalf of. So it's not just the fact that if I'm granted a power of attorney and I have access to somebody's bank account, that does not mean that just because I have access that I have the right to go in and take money and use it for myself or use it for somebody else. Um, and my, my limitations uh, are, are not just the scope of authority, but it's also limited based on what am I doing that's actually benefiting the person or protecting their interests as part of, uh, of this role that I'm playing. So regardless of which hat I'm wearing, there's always a framework that, uh, that goes on here. So <clears throat> um, there's, uh, again, there's, there's always that limitation of scope of authority um, and whether that's defined in a document like a power of attorney or defined in statute or limited uh, limitations placed within a court order, um, that's always going to be the first thing because you can't do anything that falls outside of whatever your scope of authority is, regardless of what kind of role you're playing. Uh, but beyond that, um, then there's there's uh, there's some steps that we go through to try to determine how should we be making some of these decisions. Um, and a lot of this has to do with just the, the steps related to making decisions as an alternate decision maker for somebody else um, who either is unable to make decisions or 
um, uh, maybe has limitations of some types of decisions uh, that they are unable to make uh, or need to make those decisions with support. Um, and so we always look at what direction can we get from the person. Uh, and in this case, I'm, I'm kind of talking in terms as conservator where I have a person who's still presently alive. Um, and when I'm making financial decisions, I have to be thinking about what that person's stated preferences are. And if they're able to interact with me and, and give me uh, give me their, uh, their preferences about things, or if I'm able to interview family members um, and, uh, and understand historically maybe what the person has done. Um, but one of the risks of the person telling me the things that they want me to do is that when I'm getting direction directly from the person, I may not always be getting what actually would be in the best interest of the person. <clears throat> um, and it could well be that, uh, that if I carried out the, the wishes that they expressed to me, <coughs> it could be potentially really risky or even uh, you know, uh, financially uh, very harmful to do some of the things that they want me to do. Um, you know, if they want me to go and, and place all of their investments in Tesla stock. Um, which I might say, well, you know, over the last couple of years, that would have been a brilliant decision. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that two years from now, that would be a brilliant decision. And then we could be opening up uh, a whole can of worms of, well, why did we go from 100,000 to 300,000 to four um, and, uh, or to, you know, four dollars, not four dollars. Um, and uh, anyway, but uh, much like the guardian may may have to balance when the person says, I want to be able to go and, and go skydiving, um, we're going to have to take into account that balance of we want to get direction from the person and get their input and understand what their value framework looks like. Um, <clears throat> but we also have some duties and obligations to protect the person um, much as, as we might a friend or relative or, or a child uh, within our family, uh, we want to give them autonomy, but we want to make sure that, that, they, uh, that there's some, some guardrails put into place. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so if, uh, if we are not able to get direction from the person or if direction from the person isn't necessarily giving us what we need to be able to make that decision, then we may have to look at the option of substituted judgment. And substituted judgment differs from that in terms of uh, it, it is making our best guess as to what the person's decision would have been um, if they were able to have made the decision the same way they would have made it historically. And it might be that presently, because they've had a traumatic brain injury or they've, uh, they've developed a, a dementia-related disorder, uh, that they're not capable of, of processing those kinds of things or making those kinds of decisions anymore. Um, and so it becomes the question of what would they have done? Uh, what would they do? And, uh, and sometimes if the person's not able to express that, that again is where we, we try to get historical information and historical context from, uh, from friends and family members uh, to help inform us of what they would have wanted to do. Um, how have they used this kind of thing in the past? Uh, what groups and charitable organizations have they supported in the past? Um, and is that something that we need to continue to do in order to honor what they've, uh, what they've done and, and um, what their value system is? Um, and then the, the lowest tier on that, uh, on that chart is best interest. So if we, if we can't make a decision with direct information from the person, um, if we are unable to determine enough information from, uh, to form a substituted judgment on behalf of the person, <coughs> then, uh, then we have to look at that, that very baseline uh, uh, interest of just the, what's in the best interest of the person. And that's where we still have to try to balance the preferences uh, of the person with the concepts of safety and prudence, uh, because we uh, we 
uh, we want to make sure that money is being used wisely. Uh, but if I give somebody a thousand dollars cash and they've got a history of, uh, of going out and, uh, and obtaining illegal substances uh, with large amounts of cash, then that's probably not protecting the person to give them access to large amounts of cash. Um, and so best interest uh, is trying to help protect the person while making good judgment and good decisions. Uh, but the risk is that it may be contrary to the expressions of, uh, of the person. Um, and this is always the big balancing act in the fiduciary world for particularly, again, for people who are, are living, um, is balancing these, these ideas of, of providing safety and protection, but also still trying to allow for the maximum amount of self-determination possible uh, and, uh, and allowing somebody to live in the least restrictive environment possible. Um, it's not just a matter of making sure that they're uh, that they're living in the situation that's the most convenient for the family or the most convenient for me. Um, it's, it's sometimes going um, you know, above and beyond in certain ways um, in order to make sure that, that they still have some sense of, of involvement and value um, and that their, their dignity is being preserved in this process. All right, we can move on. So there are ethical considerations that, that need to be taken into account as well. Um, so fiduciaries um, are expected to operate under a, a certain code of ethics. Um, and a code of ethics really only um, is only useful to the extent that, that the person granted that authority decides that they're going to follow those rules and ethics. Um, and in Idaho, there's really not, uh, not a lot um, that has been done to codify exactly what uh, the, the ethical obligations are for people who are acting in fiduciary capacities, um, particularly under power of attorney or as conservator. So in Idaho, a couple of years ago, almost two years ago, um, a new rule was passed in the state that requires that anybody who is acting as a, a conservator or a guardian uh, for other people other than family members and receiving compensation for those services, uh, that they have to now be certified national guardians, uh, either guardians of the estate or guardians of the, per of the person, um, partially because that's the really the, it was the best compromise rather than uh, the state of Idaho developing a, a bureau specifically to oversee guardians and fiduciaries uh, in the state, um, but also meant that now we've got uh, guardians uh, adhering to a set of standards and a set of ethics that uh, have been promoted through the National Guardianship Association for uh, many years. Um, and those standards are available for anybody to look at. I've got the web address listed there on this slide under guardianship.org backslash standards. Um, and those standards go through a, a wide array of uh, uh, expectations and guidelines uh, for people acting as guardian or acting as conservator for a person. But many of them apply in all kinds of fiduciary roles, again, whether that's acting as a power of attorney for finances or power of attorney for healthcare, uh, or after somebody's passing, um, acting as a trustee or acting as a personal representative of their estate. So what are some, what is some of the common types of conflicts of interest that come up and ethical uh, breaches that, that come up? Um, one thing that, I am shocked when I, I see it, but it still happens, is uh, self-dealing. Uh, and we have an obligation to avoid self-dealing uh, in terms of performing a transaction that provides, uh, provides direct benefit to the fiduciary or a close associate or family member of the fiduciary. Uh, a, a good example of that might be a, a case where uh, you know, if, if there's a person uh, who owned multiple properties and uh, somebody was named as a conservator and one of the properties needs to be sold in order to raise money to, to pay for the person's long-term care, 
Well, the conservator can't just sell that property to uh, to one of their family members or one of their close friends for less than the, the full market value of that property. Um, <clears throat> or they, they can't, uh, can't hire uh, a realtor who happens to be their, their cousin or their brother or sister-in-law uh, and, uh, and have that realtor get paid uh, a commission for selling the property without disclosing that potential conflict of interest uh, to, uh, to all the people that might be involved and, and uh, getting approval from the courts. Um, <clears throat> hiring people to do work. And this is one that, that is actually surprisingly common um, where you, um, you know, if there's a house that needs to be cleaned out, um, if I hire a family member to provide those cleaning services or moving services or landscaping services or construction services uh, or roof repair or any of these kinds of things that need to be done, and I'm paying them from the person's money, uh, again, that's, a, that's the appearance of a conflict of interest that I'm using this person's money to pay somebody close to me uh, for services that could have been provided by any wide variety of people. Um, and what guarantees do we have to the person's family or to the courts that, uh, that the services provided were of the, the same quality that we would have been able to obtain from, uh, from another vendor? Um, or for the same price. Uh, and so uh, sometimes even if you've got somebody who says, hey, I'll go do it for, you know, for a few bucks cheaper than, uh, than what this other fencing contractor is, is quoting, um, it's still a real ethical danger zone for a fiduciary uh, because there's so many ways that that could, could blow up uh, back on them. Uh, again, you know, if it's not quality work, um, if the person doing the work doesn't have the experience and the qualifications to be able to perform that work uh, well, then that's creating liability. Um, and there's also issue of, uh, well, what happens if something goes badly? What if they cause a problem? What if they cause an injury? Um, and uh, do they have uh, liability insurance or, or uh, professional bonding that would protect the person or protect their estate? Um, from uh, from some kind of claim. Uh, so lots of reasons why hiring close people um, is just not a good idea and really should be avoided. Um, but there are some situations where that's kind of unavoidable. Um, we had a, a case uh, a few years ago uh, that, that was based up uh, in a, a small rural town uh, between Weezer and McCall. And when it came to hiring caregivers to help provide care for an elderly person, <clears throat> the availability was just limited and it was unavoidable that we were going to have to hire uh, family members and, and close friends to provide those services because there's just nobody else available to even provide the service. Um, so when you have situations like that where the, con the potential conflict of interest is kind of unavoidable, then it's still an issue where it needs to be out in the open and everybody needs to be aware that this is an issue <clears throat> and that we need to be able to, uh, to mitigate that or explain why it is we didn't have another option. Um, it's not like I had three fencing contractors because the only person that does any fencing work is just, you know, Joe Smith down the road. Um, <clears throat> so the next area is uh, in purchasing, selling, transferring, or gifting property um, either to yourself or to family members. Um, and again, the, the things that belong to the person that, that you've been granted authority over belong to them um, and should benefit them, or if not them, should benefit their family members as directed by, uh, by their will or their, their estate planning documents. Um, and anytime uh, any of that, uh, property, whether, again, whether it's a real estate property, whether it's a car, whether it's furniture, whether it's artwork, musical instruments, anything like that. Um, it's, again, the appearance of conflict of interest. Uh, how do we know if, uh, if the, the fiduciary or somebody close to them purchases those things? How do we know that the, they paid fair value for it <clears throat> and that they didn't buy it uh, for significantly less than the market value, 
uh, or just take it and not report it. Um, and again, not, not provide any value back to the person. So uh, our, <coughs> excuse me, our business policy has always been that, uh, that even if we're selling something at auction or we've, got, we've hired somebody as an estate liquidator, I never have anybody on my staff uh, allowed to go and buy any of those things, even if it's under an auction where everybody else is able to bid too, just to avoid any potential appearance of that kind of conflict. Um, <clears throat> the next area is loaning money to or accepting money or gifts from the person. Again, if I'm acting as a fiduciary for a person, um, if I turn them into a, into a debtor where they owe money to me because I'm loaning them money for something, um, I'm, I'm, I'm changing the dynamics of the relationship. It's no longer just that I'm managing money for them. I'm, I'm now using my authority over them to put them in a position where they owe me something. Um, that's a huge violation. Um, or if they want to gift something to me because they're so happy with what I've done, uh, I still can't accept it. Um, I, and I, I need to maintain that professional distance and be able to say, thank you, I, I appreciate the consideration, but I, I can't accept any of these things. Um, one of the muddy areas is using the person's money to benefit someone other than the person. Well, obviously, if I'm directly giving money or property to somebody uh, who wouldn't be otherwise entitled to it, that's a huge issue. Uh, but there's also the question of, well, now, what if I have responsibility for one person or one beneficiary, and I'm paying for things for that person, but, uh, but maybe I'm paying rent, but there's two other people living with that person. Am I paying rent for all three people? Um, is that fair? Is that a reasonable use of, of the, the money and the responsibility that I have? Um, because I can't just provide direct benefit to other people through what I'm doing for the, the primary benefit of the, the person that I'm responsible to. Uh, and sometimes it's a balancing act um, because, you know, I, I, if I'm buying a car so that somebody has access to transportation, uh, but they have a family member that sometimes uses the car uh, to, you know, go to the movies, um, well, that... Again, it's, those kinds of things might be unavoidable, uh, but if I find out that, uh, that somebody else is using the person's car uh, to commute to the other person's job on a regular basis, well, that's no longer providing the benefit that it's supposed to, um, and that's not just a limited benefit to the other person. They're using it for themselves and not for the person that should be getting benefit from it. <clears throat> and lastly on here, uh, is commingling assets with the uh, so uh, you always have to be very careful and make sure that all of the money and property of the person is separate from the money and property of the fiduciary. There needs to be clear lines and clear uh, ability to define what belongs to that person and what belongs to the fiduciary, and you do not mix them together ever. Um, uh, again, you, you don't want to be appointed as a conservator for somebody or acting as a power of attorney for somebody and open up a joint checking account and some of the money is yours and some of the money is theirs. And how do you ever decipher that? Um, if, you if you both have uh, money going into it and money going out of it, you're creating an accounting nightmare and not to mention uh, just a, an ethical quagmire that, uh, that can really um, create problems and, and can cause other people to, uh, to question whether or not you're doing your job right. So beyond that, beyond these, these ethical considerations, um, you know, the, there's always kind of the, the basic assumptions that, uh, that a fiduciary should be able to provide an accounting for what they've done. They should be able to provide a report of all of the income that's come in and all the distributions and checks that have been written going out. Um, and being able to account for all of the property that, that belonged to the person at the beginning of their appointment and all of the money and property that belongs to the person as of the end of that accounting period, whether that's an annual accounting to a court or a final accounting for an estate, uh, there should be a clear picture of what was started with, what happened in the middle, and where everything's ending out and, and uh, being you know, 
making those final distributions out to somebody else. Um, and if you if you can't account for something, if you can't answer a question when somebody says, "Hey, what happened uh, to that Smith and Wesson, or or what happened to that artwork?" Um, then that creates uh, again creates some real problems. <clears throat> All right, uh, and I think we've got a, a few minutes left here at the the end of the the slides. But I will open it up, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take a, a few minutes of Q and A here. So, Paul, I have a question for you. Um, you know, using a, a professional fiduciary, what size of an estate um, does it make sense or, or, or does it work? I mean, I have no idea what the costs of a professional fiduciary are. And do you find a lot of people do try to do it themselves because they don't think they can afford it? Is that not an appropriate way to think about it. How do you recommend somebody consider, can I afford this? Should I afford this? How much does it cost? Right, yeah, well, and that is that is a great question. One that obviously I get all the time um, because we don't do it for free. We're not a nonprofit organization that, that's able to provide these services and we're not, a, we're not a government agency providing these services for somebody else uh, with, with government funding. <clears throat> and as much as I wish that was the case, I don't expect to see an office of public guardianship in Idaho anytime in the next century and a half. <laughs> um, but uh, but the question is what at what point does it make sense? Um, and I would say, um, well, it depends. Um, and you know, we've we have managed cases that are are multi-million dollar cases. We've managed cases uh, that in in some cases have been less than a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but it, those are typically on the smaller side. Uh, that's typically where there's just there's really not anybody uh, anybody else that's an appropriate party uh, to be able to to manage things on behalf of somebody else. Um, and the costs are largely dependent on the uh, the amount of time involved um, in the case. And uh, and I, I will say, you know, one of the one of the things that we find is that some of the cases that cost the most are cases where somebody else was appointed before us and they made a mess out of things. Um, and so I have, you know, just like with uh, building a house or doing an addition or, or, uh, or having a consultant for your business, if you hire the wrong person, it can cost you way more than just what the cost of their services was. Uh, to, to fix a problem can be much more expensive. Um, and it's not just, the, the cost related to uh, you know a company like Tresco, uh, it's the cost related to sometimes the court processes involved and litigation to hold somebody accountable for the things that went wrong before we we got involved. Um, so I, I do try to to tell people you know take into consideration what's your tolerance for things going badly with somebody who's doing it for free that doesn't have the same level of experience that someone like Tresco might have. Um, and, uh, and so you know, it's hard to say, I mean, there's some cases that, that we're involved in where the annual costs are, you know, less than maybe three, $4,000 a year. Uh, there, there's some cases where it's 20, $25,000, uh, just based on the, the enormous, uh, time demands of that particular case, either because there's highly complex kinds of assets being managed. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, business interests or uh, commercial properties uh, and, you know, who knows what else might be out there. Um, or if you have, <clears throat> if you have multiple family members that are all in conflict um, and everybody's arguing over what to do and there's one bad actor that everybody's pointing the finger at and they're making life miserable for everybody uh, and again, you know, those cases tend to not only be expensive on our side, but they tend to be even more expensive on the legal side uh, with the, the attorneys that, that are uh, frequently involved in, uh, in dealing with those kinds of issues as well. And as a follow-up then, generally, how do people determine they need a professional fiduciary or how, how do your clients typically find you? How, where are they guided by another professional? 
Ge yeah. Generally, how does that process work? How does a sure. client decide or evaluate? What, what, are, what are the triggers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, good question. So, uh, uh, how how is somebody going to find out? Well, I, you know, um, about ninety percent of the cases that we get involved with come to us through some kind of connection with a, a law firm and an attorney. Um, and so that's generally either somebody who is going to an attorney doing their estate planning and they're thinking in terms of, I, I don't trust my kids or my, I know my, my kids don't get along, um, or maybe this is my second or third marriage and, I, and we both have children from prior relationships and they don't necessarily get along. Uh, and so we just want to have somebody independent um, who's not doesn't have the emotions involved in any of this uh, that that we know can just kind of be the level head to to make the decisions for the group and say here's how things are going to go. Um, or sometimes it's just there's geographic challenges. You know, somebody uh, only has family in in New York and Alabama, and how are they going to deal with a condo in McCall and a house here in Boise and uh, and a business that needs to get wound down and taxes that have to get filed and so a lot of times when it, there's just time consuming stuff that the family just doesn't have the time for, that's oftentimes again, where they, they might bring in uh, an outside company like us to be able to help out. Um, or sometimes it's just a matter of, I wanna take advantage of somebody who's an expert and somebody who really knows what they're doing. Uh, because even if I've got, if I have kids that I love and trust and they're capable, smart people, when I'm aging and I'm in my 70s, 80s and thinking about my final days and, and what's going to happen after I go, uh, my kids are probably going to be in their 40s, 50s, and they've got kids and they're in careers. And how much time do they have to deal with, uh, with my affairs at that stage of life? And so maybe, um, maybe it's worthwhile having an independent third party come in that's got the expertise, has the ability to deal with all this stuff effectively and efficiently. Um, and that's, you know, that's really kind of what Tresco brings to the table is that we've done this, you know, as I've told people, we've done this hundreds and hundreds of times over the years. Um, so we're really good at knowing what needs to get done, making sure things get done correctly, making sure that we're calling the right people to get things done. If we don't know what, need, what needs to be done um, and just we've developed a network that, that we can get through that process efficiently the first time without having to go back and fix a bunch of mistakes after the fact. Um, <clears throat> Paul, could you take a um, quick minute and describe what representative payee is and does Tresco do that for clients? Sure, that's, a, that's another good question. So representative payee um, specifically refers to somebody who is acting uh, within a very limited authority, acting as a representative payee for benefits generally under Social Security uh, or under veterans benefits that are being paid for a person. Um, and a representative payee uh, collects that money um, and writes checks on behalf of the person and is basically like a daily money manager uh, for, for the person uh, to pay bills or provide allowance money or uh, you know, what, whatever is needed. Um, and it's a very, very narrow scope of authority. Um, and Tresco is unable to provide that service broadly, even though it's desperately needed. There's so many people that really could use it and it really would maximize their, their independence um, for, uh, for many people. Um, the biggest problem is that social security only allows us to get paid $25 a month for providing that service. Um, so it's just not economically feasible for us to only have the authority of paying bills for somebody. Um, and so we, we only take on that role when it's uh, adjunct to a, another role that we're, that we're playing if we're acting as a trustee or we're acting as a conservator for the person. And that <clears throat> specifically has to be applied for separately. Um, POA does not cover that. Correct. Yeah, you, you have to apply with the agency that's providing that benefit to the person and get approved by them uh, in order to act as the representative payee. So it's not uncommon, particularly in, in areas of, of conservatorship of the person, 
uh, or rather conservatorship of the estate of the, the person uh, where we apply to act as representative payee. So we're receiving their social security benefits directly to us, but there's generally other income and assets that we're managing also. So it's not just paying bills from social security, it's also managing property and investments and, and, uh, and things like that in addition to that. So I would assume similarly, you kind of mentioned for the VA, um, a VA fight financial fiduciary right. as yep. well. And, and we, uh, at, this, at this point in time, the VA made changes a few years ago uh, in their policy and procedures regarding uh, VA fiduciaries. And we're no longer providing those services because they've, they've become extremely cumbersome, uh, which is really unfortunate because there's a, a large group of veterans that really uh, would benefit from providing that service. And, uh, and they're really struggling now that they've kicked out all of the professional fiduciaries out of that system. They're really struggling to find people who are willing to act as a, a VA fiduciary uh, when, when they've got such tight restrictions on what they're willing to allow. A good question. Other Any questions? Other, other questions? Come off mute if you have a question. All right. Well, Paul, I thank you so much for being with us today. And we will preserve this in posterity on our website. Um, All right. <laughs> In the near future, we thank you so much for being here and, and going through this. I think a lot of people don't understand that there are some real significant boundaries around this role of both power of attorney for finances, conservatorship, that ah, I can do what I want. But no, this is there are fiduciary um, accountabilities here. And, um, and when they're not adhered to, then it's a form of exploitation. That's right and Department of uh, Health and Welfare or uh, uh, Protective Services, Adult Protective Services will step in. Yep. Along yeah. that well, you know, and, and nobody brought up Britney Spears, which is probably the most common cultural reference that I, I hear currently. Uh, and, you know, the Britney Spears case, um, in some respects, has actually been a really positive thing for the image of professional guardians and conservators even though Brittany's case specifically has some real problems. Uh, and of course, I can guarantee you that the real story still has nothing to do, it is nothing like anything that you've read in any account or anything that you've seen in any of the actual documentaries that have been put out there. Um, but the, the reality is it puts a face and, a, and you know, some, somebody that people can identify with uh, and raises the question of how do we make sure that people who need guardianship or need conservatorship uh, are being protected the way that they should. Uh, but how do we make sure that the people who no longer need that, um, that the guardianship is, is being terminated or the conservatorship is being terminated so the person uh, has a restoration of rights, um, or even if that means not, not maybe not a full termination, but maybe a, a further restriction of the authority of the, uh, of the fiduciary, and a broadening of, uh, of independence of the person uh, that, uh, that's subject to that guardianship or conservatorship. So it's still an important conversation that we're having. And uh, I, I, I know that it's a, a topic of frequent conversation in our discussions with the National Guardianship Association. Well, and then there was the movie, I Care a Lot for Guardians. So yes. yes. Another excellent that. example of how we never act. <laughs> Exactly. Great film, but right. not realistic. Sometimes you can learn a lot from a bad example. <laughs> yes, that's very true. <laughs> yeah, very you can true. learn a lot by knowing what you don't want to have happen. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, having worked with Paul on the, the board and being a, a, a conservator and guardian myself of a family member, those standards from the National Guardianship Association are really quite phenomenal. I believe there's like 28 standards out there and they cover both the role of guardian of the person and guardian of the state. And I strongly encourage any of you, if you have ever come close to a role like that, those are good to go get and understand that those are the expectations um, for you in those roles. So 
Paul, as always, I enjoy having you around and learning from you and your expertise. I miss Thank working you. with you on a more regular basis on uh, Idaho uh, Guardianship and Fiduciary Association, which is another great organization you should all know about. And there's good training available through there as well, specific to this topic. Um, I would like to thank Paul again for very much from Tresco for being with us today. Um, his website is here on this slide. I'd like to thank again our sponsors, Oasis Senior Advisors and A Mind for All Seasons. Um, if you are interested in joining our Learn mailing list, you'll receive an email inviting you to join, but you must confirm the subscription. We will not fill your box with information about all of our future uh, community education opportunities, unless you say, yes, I'd like to receive them. So be sure to check your junk folder in case you don't see it for this information and respond. And coming up next, um, we have some additional great, we always have great work webinars. We're, we, we've got great stuff to learn. Um, effectively managing caregiving services. This one's particularly near and dear to my heart. Um, we will have the key presenting. Um, they've recently changed their name from home care assistance. But how do you manage people that come into your home to help provide care to you or to a loved one? Um, what are the things you need to know, what to expect, and how to get that happening? We've got Transforming Your Life After 60 um, will be fun and invigorating, and we may be doing stuff in front of our cameras, I'm not sure. We've got a great presentation on elder abuse awareness and prevention, and June is Elder Abuse um, Awareness Month, so very appropriate and timing, timely there. And then we'll close the summer, or the spring semester with navigating your path to retirement, something that I will definitely be paying attention to because that's the path I'm on. So I thank you all for being here and look forward to seeing you at our next session.